Yes. Now's where it gets hardcore. Okay. So, talk starting again. If you want to sit down or if you want to talk, if you want to go outside, that'd be great. Okay. So, the implementation. Um, there, um, so, we start off with mail. Mail comes in, gets through Exum, goes through proc mail, some of the spam stuff gets deleted, then it gets to receive. Receives a little script that just dumps the, um, basically the contents of the mail into a file in spool incoming. Um, every five minutes at the moment, but basically every few minutes, all those, all those things get spam checked, and most of them thus get deleted. Um, every 15 minutes, so three minutes past the hour, 18 minutes past the hour, 33 minutes past the hour, and 48 minutes past the hour, um, process all gets invoked, and that's when bugs actually get processed. Um, you won't, you'll see the response to that on the website, so if you're really desperate to see that a bug actually gets recorded and stuff, three minutes past the hour or every 15 minutes thereafter is when to check. Um, you won't actually get mail then because it gets spooled and just gets sent out whenever. Process all then passes to two scripts called process and service. I think those names are quite self-documenting. Um, does anyone not? Um, process does the, does the general bug mails. It's the one that handles like the package pseudo header sort of um, file a bug report to submit. It handles the done mail. It handles the quiet, maint only, all that crap. The functionality is determined by the email address. Um, the email address is hard coded in, is kind of coded into the file name that's put into the spool directory. Um, that's pretty much it. Um, the idea is that it stores the body of the mail, maybe opens a new bug, maybe closes it, whatever else. But it's all determined by the email address and maybe the pseudo headers. Um, and that's about it. That's what process does. Service, on the other hand, handles the control at mails. Um, has everyone here actually used control at? Who hasn't? Okay, you should. Control at's a really wonderful little interface. Um, it's useful for, it's usable for everyone as long as you're kind of an advanced, like if you're here you should be an advanced enough Debian user to get some value out of it. And if you can help other pe help clean up other people's bugs, that's kind of a useful sort of thing to do. Um, Oh, is that? Yes. So in dev scripts, there's the BTS tool, um, which lets you kind of easily send stuff to the bug tracking system control interface. Um, but if you're a real man or a real woman, as the case may be, you should just kind of mail it directly because that's cooler. Um, and so, yeah, the idea is one command per line. Um, after you say thanks or k thanks bye, um, you can just put freeform commentary. And the idea is that kind of, it's all email, so you can CC people, and if you send it to the bug tracking system, it'll be recorded there for posterity. Okay. Errorlib is another script. It's horrible. Um, good, he's still asleep. Um, it kind of um, includes some probably Perl 4 code still. Um, Debugs was the reason that Perl 4 stayed on master for quite a while after Perl 5 came out. Um, Errorlib is kind of particularly scary. It uses lots of global variables and stuff like that. And as far as modularization concer is concerned, it would be really nice to have Errorlib disappear or maybe even only handle errors. And yeah, it's um, quite scary. If you need to go into it, you need to kind of put on your breathing apparatus and delve straight into the complicated Perl. Okay, and then obviously there's the CGI scripts. The CGI scripts are completely separate because when they were implemented, I wasn't on the debugs team and I just thought, hey, you should be able to do this with CGI, so I'll do that in my home directory and hey, look, it works. I don't need any particular access. Um, the common.perl is kind of the equivalent of errorlib.perl. It's meant to be a little bit more modular and tidy and it kind of was when I wrote it, but it's accreted a little bit since then. Um, there are three kind of scripts that actually do useful CGI stuff that are obviously up there. I hope. Good. 
Um, there's the bug report one, which displays the contents of a bug report. There's a package report, which can collates individual bugs that are meant to be of interest. Um, originally, that was just for packages. It's now for basically everything. And has anyone here used packageindex.cgi? Wow. Uh, used it, oh, tried it, yeah. seen how it works. So yeah, the bug tracking system used to have um, just lists of all the bugs in all the packages that you could scroll to a random point, click, and then fix something as bug roulette sort of stuff. And implementing the CGI's figure, well, complete replacements are good, and so implemented that, but there are kind of too many packages in Debian and too many maintainers and too many whatever else for it to be particularly useful. Um, in theory, if someone wants to grab that and include some sort of pagination so that you get the first hundred or so packages and then can click to page two, that might start making that more useful. Um, that's the sort of script that you want to look at if you want to say, I want to look at the packages with the top 10 most bugs and then I can help out with that because obviously that's where some effort's needed. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, I say things like that because that means we're going to start going into deeper stuff. Okay, bug number 204531. This was, I was looking for some bugs to fix for this talk to kind of give a demo. And this one seemed both reasonably old and reasonably easy. So this was a question before, I think, from someone. The sort of thing you kind of want to be able to do, or at least some people want to be able to do, and I thought was kind of interesting, is limit what, like, say, okay, I haven't been looking at my package for the last month. Let's just see only the bugs that have been filed in that month. So I've probably missed them before. I might be interested in them. So the idea of this patch is just to add some um, parameters to the, to the package report CGI. Um, or to the common script in this case, um, to say min days um, is 50, so I don't want any bugs that have been reported in the last 50 days, or max days equals 100. I don't want any bugs that have been reported over 100 days because if they've been that old, then obviously I'm not going to fix them anyway. Okay, so... Uh, um, so this bit here is the changes to the package report.cgi. Um, it basically just says, get the parameter max days, default to negative one, get the param parameters min days, default to zero, and then pass those through to common.perl. Okay, can everyone kind of understand or relate what I just said to the scripts up there, to the changes up there? If you can't, stick up your hand. Okay. So then the real meat of most of this stuff goes in common.perl, which is kind of getting a bit kludgy, but it lets you, it lets the actual CGI scripts mostly worry about the HTML rather than the fiddling with the bugs. So the first bit just says, okay, if I get told that the min days option is this value, then I need to store it in this variable. Um, then the interesting bits down the bottom are basically just changes to the to the function that gets the interesting bugs and says, okay, um, so the bit right down the bottom says, okay, if the bugs, if the bugs this old, um, dividing by the appropriate factor to convert seconds since the epoch into days, then I'm probably not interested in it. Or if it's not old enough, then I'm not interested in that case either. So that's kind of the level of hacking you need to do to change the CGI scripts. Um, the bit in the middle is the kind of kludgy thing so that if you're clicking between bugs, you can kind of keep the same options. In theory, that would probably be much nicer to do with cookies. Um, back when CGI scripts were implemented, cookies were evil. Does anyone remember the good old days when cookies were evil? Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, they're not anymore. Um, so some of the things that would be good to do with cookies are kind of the configuration sort of stuff. So one of the options Debbugs has is um, an option, say, repeat merged equals no. So you only see one copy of each of the merged bugs. If you get lots of duplicates filed, that's probably handy. Another one is an option to say reverse equals yes, which will let you 
read the read the actual bug report messages in blog kind of order, so the most recent message first. And that's the way the bug tracking system always used to be, but kind of no one actually likes as far as I know. And those sort of things would be really useful to do as kind of cookies, so that you set it once, um, it's a personal kind of setting, you don't, it's not reflected in the URL at all, so you don't have to worry about pasting it in places like that. And that's kind of been on the drawing board for ages, but needs someone new and enthusiastic to implement, probably. Okay. Anyone want to ask some questions about that? Okay. So, uh, one of the other scripts that often requires hacking is the server script. It's the one that controls what you can send to control. That was a bit redundant, but hey. So, here's an example change for it, which is just to allow you to th say, K hey, thanks, bye, instead of just thanks at the end of your message to go on and talk about whatever. Um, there are certain groups of people who like to say, K hey, thanks, bye. Um, yeah, so we need more of a... Oh, yeah. I don't think that would be um, appropriate for the kind of demeanor we're trying to present with Debian. If you wanted to say, fuck off in your private, in your private <laughs> weblog, on the other hand, that would be fine. Okay, so the way the way um, the server script is structured, which you might be able to infer from that, is it's basically just passes through each of the um, each of the lines in the file in the in the in the mail to the control app, and tries to match against a command. So the simplest command there is just the stop, quit, thanks, bye, whatever command, and it's obviously the first. Um, there are other ones like obviously turning on debug information and all the other commands. Um, so most of them, which you'll see later, also have to do things like actually change bug reports and use the horrible error lib stuff and have to indicate that actually this line was okay, you don't need to complain about it in the transcript and whatever else. Um, you can see there is a transcript function there, which is what actually replies to the um, is included in the transcript reply to the person who mailed control at bugs.debian.org. Um, that's the way you kind of give feedback to the user. Okay, does everyone think they can cope with making that sort of change? Does anyone not? Excellent. We're full of hackers. Okay. Is Joey Hess in the audience? Uh, not as far as I can see. This is Joey's pet bug. He filed it about three years ago. Um, he then got bored with all of us ignoring it and not even replying to the bug and decided, oh, well, dead bugs, yeah, I can hack on that. And so he did. Um, so the idea behind this is basically, I'm sorry, I'm missing, aren't I? Sorry, just pretend I've said that in five minutes' time. This is bug subscriptions. Um, has everyone heard of packages.qa.debian.org? Has everyone used it? Yeah. Who here has um, done an NMU and not used it? Shame. Shame on you. Um, so basically this is the half-hearted attempt that was done by Raphael, I think, uh, a couple of years ago now, which lets you subscribe to all the bugs against a package, which is really useful for NMUs so you can see, oh my god, people are suddenly filing heaps of bugs after I NMU'd this package because I screwed it up completely. Um, and the way this works is just it sends copies of each of the mails to a particular address on packages.qa.debian.org. So you can see the, uh, the G subscription domain. All the configuration for debugs is from etka debugs config. Um, it's basically just a Perl script that, or a Perl script fragment that sets a bunch of variables like G subscription domain um, and other ones which we can't mention in polite company. Um, and so, in theory, most of the configuration stuff is actually changeable to not refer to Debian. In practice, most of the CGI stuff is hard-coded, so it's kind of difficult to use outside of Debian. That was much better in the static HTML days. Um, it would kind of be good if someone was really excited enough about making debugs a general solution to, to actually work on that and to actually work on that and make it generalizable and make it kind of relevant for other people so that it's not just people saying, oh my God, we can't work on Debian because the bug tracking system is broken. We 
we should hack on it right now so that there's actually some kind of momentum behind it. Okay, now we're on to bug dependencies. So, bug dependencies is the sort of thing that lets you say, okay, we've got this release, release etch bug, um, but we can't actually release etch until these other bugs are finished. And how do we track that? At the moment, obviously, we track it via the release critical bugs page or some kind of separate hacky sort of thing. Um, Joey's kind of wanted to have this fixed for quite a while, and his latest, his latest impetus for it is the Debian installer stuff. So Debian installer can do a release when these bugs are fixed or is blocked by these bugs in other packages because they're completely broken and the UDEPs are screwed up. And so the issue is kind of, I want to be able to track these in the bug tracking system. I don't want to have to keep it in email or something where I'll lose it. I want to be able to just send it off and have other people follow it. So the question is kind of, what do they mean? How do you manage them? And what sort of syntax are we talking about? Um, what they mean is kind of, um, this bug can't be closed until these other bugs are fixed. Um, or that's what it's kind of being taken to mean. Um, how do you manage them? So you start getting issues like, what about circular dependencies? Do we worry about that? Or do we just let the, do we just let the people who are manipulating the bugs worry about that? Because if you have a, if you block, if you block the done message from a bug and then have it depend on something that depends on it, then neither of them can be closed. And then what sort of thing happens if you upload a, if you upload a package that claims to close the bug? Um, so there are questions like that that you need to consider if you're going to hack on dead bugs. And one of the trickiest questions is what happens when you merge things. So if you've got one bug that depends on another and then you merge it, what happens then? Does it kind of depend on itself or does the dependency disappear? What happens if you've got a few bugs that um, depend on various things? Do you, merge the, do you merge the things? Do you just refuse to merge the two bugs? Um, so does every, is everyone aware of what sort of things happen at the moment with mergers? So if you try and merge a normal and a wish list bug, what happens? It baffs. Um, if you try and merge a bug that's tagged patch and a bug that's tagged security, what happens? Yes, so the two bugs get merged. It doesn't complain, and it will give both bugs both tags in future. Um, one of the things which starts causing problems with the dependency stuff is you also have problems with the clone command. Um, who here hasn't um, heard of or used the clone command? Don't be shy, stick your hand up. Clone. So the clone command um, I made up a little while ago to try and make it easier to do installation reports. So you can start off with one bug, then clone, clone it into four or five different bugs, reassign them to other packages, and keep on working. For dependencies, um, question? Just before I forget, um, I always, if I want to clone a bug, I always like send in the bug, and then the next 15 minutes, I end up checking my inbox, checking my inbox until I finally have the ID. Um, would there be a possibility in the future to actually um, file two bugs with one message? Um, I've never heard of that idea before. I don't see why it would be impossible. Okay, I'll, I'll file a bug. Um, I'm, not <laughs> I'm not sure that it wouldn't be better to just have it be much easier to find out the ID you're going to get rather than waiting for a response yeah. mail. Why do you want to do the cloned bug as opposed to uh, filing the same bug on multiple packages? You do know you can specify multiple packages on the bug. Yeah. Um, for everyone who didn't, who didn't hear that or didn't know, you can file a bug against multiple packages. So say package colon, um, I don't know, general comma base comma x11 comma whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Brandon's sitting right in front of me. It's very hard to think of random package names. Um, um, and the other thing you can obviously do um, is instead of just cloning, you can file multiple bugs and then have, have dependencies between them if you want to track them that way too. Um, 
but yeah, the issue with clone and dependencies is then that if a bug depends on a bug that is then going to be cloned, does the old bug now depend on both of them? Does it depend on the first one? Does it depend on the second one? Um, these are the sort of issues that make make adding new fields to bugs particularly not necessarily difficult, but kind of requiring a little bit of thought up front. So the way that isn't quite Joey's patch, but is the way that kind of seemed more slightly more intuitive afterwards was the commands on the bottom there. So I suppose I can point to them with that, can't I? So the theory with those sort of things is um, that you say, I want to block the closure of this bug, number 123456, by, by waiting for this other bug to be fixed, number 345678. And if that turns out to have been a mistake, then I can unblock it later. Um, what do people think of that command? Does that seem kind of easy to understand? Um, and in particular, does it seem easy to understand which one's going to be blocked and which one isn't? Hands up if you think it's a reasonable thing. Hands up if, okay, put your hands down. Hands up if you find it kind of confusing. Uh, okay. Um, the ones we've had before that would have been the other way around. Small suggestion, could you just add support for width? Okay. Small suggestion, could you add support for width as a synonym for by? I mean, somehow I would just... Block one, two, three, four, five, six with... Three, yes. four, five, six, eight, se uh, six, seven, eight. Yeah, that would be quite easy. Yeah. Um, can you uh, IRC message that on IRC? Do you have net access now? Yeah. Can you message me that on IRC, please? Absolutely. Um, I don't care. Um, okay. So, the error lib changes are the first ones because they're kind of easy for a change. Um, and the only change there is that you need to add, the, add a couple of fields to the summary information. So you need to have links both ways so that if you close a bug, you can find out which ones it was blocking. And if you try and close a bug, you can say, oh, no, it's crap. OK, here we go. I've got 15 minutes left. Um, and you need to be able to go both ways. So you need both fields. And then you need to keep them in sync as well. There's the same problem with merged bugs there, but it's slightly more complicated for dependencies. OK, the bug report CGI change is fairly simple. You need to actually get the summary information, which is done elsewhere. And then you need to look at it. So you need to have a look at the block by status. And then you just need to put some HTML output. Um, you can, if you want to look at, the, at the, an example of this, there's some bug, which number I've forgotten. Crap. Um, the examples of these are currently on slash talk slash bug report dot CGI on the bug tracking system. OK. The service changes are a lot more complicated. Um, as you can see, it adds a new command. So that's the else if line at the top. And then it parses that. So changing um, by to support by or with is obviously just a matter of changing by or with to the appropriate regex. regex. Um, you then kind of parse that. And you then need to go and look for merge bugs so that if you say, I want to block this bug with these things, then if that's merged with five other bugs, you've got to handle all, updating all those five other bugs as well. Um, and if some of the bugs don't exist, then you probably want to complain about that. In this case, it just continues after complaining as long as it can. OK, so some more transcript information report. These bugs were blocked by these things so that if you later have find you screw up, you can just go back and change it back. Um, OK, so you'll see in here as well that there's a couple of these strange things called cancel bug and get bug. They're error lib functions that just manipulate global vari variables that you have to be kind of careful with. Um, and yeah, that's basically the way that you actually get at bugs. The merged bug stuff is kind of handled in there as well. Um, as long as you tell it about which bugs that you merged with. OK. So the other thing that the control interface does is it um, CCs maintainers of bugs that you've modified. 
So there's those sort of commands there too. Um, yeah, so I'll try and go through this fast-ish. And you can obviously see that there's um, other error lib stuff in there. And that's about the extent of the changes to service. They're particularly complicated because the dependency stuff is kind of complicated fundamentally. Um, and you need to work out how you want to handle stuff. This is only the first half of the dependencies patch. There are some other things that clean up some of the behavior. Um, and so yeah, this first section just changes the, this bug is blocked by this other one, or these other ones. Um, obviously after you've done that, you then need to update the other bugs. Um, and if you've removed a dependency, if you've removed a blocking, then you need to remove it from the other bugs. If you've added it, you need to add it, obviously. Um, okay, so that's actually now in the bug tracking system. So you can use that right now if you like. It doesn't actually display in the CGI scripts because I've just, I haven't modified the CGI scripts. <coughs> I've just put those in the talk subdirectory. Okay, um, we're gonna skip that one. So the other cool thing is bug subscriptions. Who here would like to, like to subscribe to an individual bug? Apparently you can probably do that as of this afternoon. Um, do you want to come up and talk about it? So hacking last night, um, we've had some people who um, decided to kind of implement a really crap solution to this, which lets you subscribe anyone to it without asking confirmation, kind of the ultimate yes. Denial of service thing. <laughs> and um, naturally, one of our list masters was kind of unimpressed with that sort of stuff. And so we've now got a semi proper implementation. Yeah, so um, the basic idea is that we're taking the mail into the. Uh, I didn't say your name. Oh, so for those who don't know, my name's Don Armstrong. Um, so the basic idea is we're taking bugs or the messages that you send to the bug. So you can subscribe to a bug by sending a message. In fact, right now, if you want to 7 subscribe at donbugs.donarmstrong.com. Uh, we're testing it on there just in case something breaks so people can actually continue to send real bug messages. Um, so the messages come in, they get processed through, uh, received, then process all calls process. If the message is sent to the appropriate uh, subscribe or any of the other list uh, uh, aliases, then it gets kicked out from the BTS directly to the list master or to uh, Murphy, uh, yeah. yeah, to Murphy, sorry, not the list masters, they don't need any more mail. Um, and so then it'll automatically get added to a uh, mailing list and um, you'll get the subscription message so you can confirm, and the confirm message again goes right back to the BTS and then any messages that get sent that would have gotten sent to bugs dist will actually get sent as well to anybody who is also subscribed to the bug. Uh, so I guess you guys want to talk about the list? Sure. Yeah, so on the uh, other side, what we've done is anytime someone tries to subscribe to a bug, uh, it uh, checks to see if there's a mailing list. If there isn't, it creates a list for that bug and then allows you to subscribe or unsubscribe from it. Every time, uh, yeah, a message comes in from the bug, it gets posted out to, um, to people. So that's pretty much it, really. Uh, but it works. So it's ready to go on the uh, list.debian.org side. And uh, we're going to corner AJ later on today and uh, either take his laptop or make him type the uh, correct commands. Don't dare touch my laptop. <laughs> <laughs> right, so you'll be uh, patching the stuff for us. All right. Uh, if anyone has any questions about that, feel free to ask. So that should be, in theory, working, I don't know, during the week at the very least. Um, We've had a patch for the bug subscriptions for a while now, and it's kind of languished because turning um, the dev bugs into a mailing list manager would kind of suck and be kind of complicated and probably be done badly. But being able to pass it off to a mailing list manager, like an actual mailing list manager, is much nicer. Um, okay. And so, yeah, the nice thing about dev bugs is that it's kind of not really maintained, so there's no real possessive sort of feel over it. So if you do start patching debugs, you've got a pretty good chance of being co-opted into the team. 
Um, Joey Hess managed to resist. He's the only one so far. Okay, how long have I got left? Okay. Um, either questions or we can go a qu quick little bit over version tracking. Version tracking is probably more interesting, but if anyone's got urgent questions, stick your hand up right now. Good, version tracking. So version tracking is the next big thing in the debugs universe. The idea is to make it so that you can use experimental a bit more effectively and you can use testing a lot more effectively and you can manage the bugs in testing a lot more effectively. Um, the kind of question that, that, that inspires version tracking is the question of when is a bug actually closed? Um, historically, it's just been closed when it's fixed and unstable, apart from a few ones which have to wait till stable because the submitter's really whiny about it. Um, but we've also had other things like, is a bug, should a bug be closed when it's fixed and unstable or only when the maintainer kind of acknowledges the fix? And we've had the fixed kind of severity in the past and the fixed tag now to kind of handle that. And it kind of works, but if, say, someone doesn't happen to actually monitor their NMUs and upload and acknowledge the bugs, then they all get lost in the, then the new bugs kind of get lost in all the NMU crap. Um, and there are kind of similar things with, do we want to worry about when the bug's fixed and unstable or when it's fixed in testing? If more stuff has to happen to actually get it fixed in testing than unstable and maybe more discussions needed, then I don't know, maybe we need to keep the bug open a little bit longer and active. And the other thing is sometimes users don't actually care when it's fixed and unstable, they care when it's fixed in testing or in stable and they can actually get at it. And if the bug's closed when it hits unstable, they get no further notification when it propagates up. And so the question then is, why do we really want to worry about defining when it's closed, like taking the fixed in, um, taking an experimental tag and a fixed in experimental tag and then adding them together and say, oh, well, it wasn't in anything else, so it must be able to be closed now. So why do we want to bother with that sort of complexity when we've already got all the version information, we know which version of which packages in which distribution, and why don't we just kind of collate that information and put it together? And so in Oslo, Colin and I kind of worked through the various thorny issues in this and came up with an implementation that, well, Colin mostly came up with the implementation that was delayed till kind of Sarge released, which it now has. Unfortunately, Colin's very busy um, but yeah, in theory, this is going to be the next big thing. Um, the version tracking then will mean that um, basically messages to done will require a pseudo header to indicate the version that the bug's actually fixed in, at which point normally the bug will just be closed as long as it's fixed in unstable. The, the tracking issue then is that the tags will be kind of reinterpreted to say that if you have a tag against a bug that says, I apply to testing, then the bug won't be archived until it is also fixed in testing. And in theory, this should work fairly well. Um, there are lots of complications in dealing with kind of the different versioning and change logs. So you can't just say this version is less than this one according to dpackage, therefore the greater version fixes all the bugs in the other version. So there's kind of the whole reopening issue there, which in theory should also handle the um, maintain a fixed bugs and the enemy not fixed bugs sort of thing. Okay. Is there anything obvious that I haven't mentioned in that that's burning people up? Yes. Could you go into a little more detail about um, how it knows what versions of a package a bug applies to? Because just because somebody yes, filed a bug against 430-1 doesn't mean it didn't exist way back in 410. Um, that's very correct. That's a big concern a lot of people have. I don't have that concern. Um, the way that debugs knows what versions, how the, the history of a package, so it knows that 1.01 is based on 1.0-0.1 and 1.1.1.0-1.1 is based on 1.0-1, but 1.02 kind of skipped the NMU entirely, is, is by having um, new RAF and KD kind of just send that information to debugs. Now the question that comes up is, that's going to be inaccurate. You might not notice a bug until it appears in version three, but it was actually in version one. 
And that's true, it will be completely inaccurate. You might not mark a bug as fixed in version until version 5 when it was actually fixed in version 4 just because you screwed up the change log. Um, I'm considering that to not matter. So I'm saying that debugs is tracking what we understand about the bug, not what actually is the case. So that means that if it's only known to be a problem between 2.0 and 5.0, that's fine. If it was also a problem in 1.0, then you'll need to send a message to control to indicate that if you actually care about that. If you don't care, you don't need to know that information. Yeah, that, yeah, that makes sense because, I mean, we can't imagine in the general case that someone will actually go research the, his, the entire history of their package to find out what the earliest revision was that actually and had the bug. searching the entire history of the package is one of the things that regression tests are valuable for, and it might be appropriate to have the regression test separate from the actual package in which it's fixed. But the control interface does provide the ability to diddle the minimax yes. numbers in the range, right? Yes. So if you do do the research, you can reflect that in the BTS? Yes. Okay, that's cool. Um, so basically each bug will have a new field which will say these are the versions in which the bug is known to have been known to exist, so it'll be the opening versions, and these are the versions in which the bug is believed to have been closed. Um, if you then find you have to reopen it, those versions will obviously have to switch around a bit. Um, and that gets quite complicated, and I don't have my notes to indicate all the little complications, but we believe we've got it handled fairly well, in theory. There will probably be more problems when people actually use it, so that will require some kind of testing. Um, probably time for one or two more questions, either on version tracking or in general. But if there aren't any, that's fine too. Yep, up the back. With the new subscribing option, uh, will submitters be subscribed op automatically, or do they have to do that uh, after they've submitted the bug? Um, so yeah, one of the really crap things about debugs is that mailing to 12345 at bugs.debian.org doesn't actually go to the submitter. You need to mail 12345-submitter, which doesn't really get recorded in the bug logs. And, um, so basically, you should always mail both. One of the things that um, individual bug subscriptions should be good for is letting people subscribe to bugs so that they always see the information. And if they weren't the person that submitted it, but they still care about it as much as, as the submitter, they can get the same kind of information. Um, if Don's patch for the subscription to bugs actually works, maybe it could be done such that um, the headers automatically configure reply to such that the bugs just simply go back to the address and nowhere else. I mean, there are there's quiet, there's submitter and all that, but um, yep. you cannot expect people to actually think about that all the time. And if I if I reply to a bug, it usually goes to the bug and the um, submitter. Yep. And if if that if I'll use good mail clients, then um, which they don't, but. Um, then everything works okay for now, but I think that a submitter should be subscribed automatically to the bug and then... Yeah, so um, we've been avoiding kind of refactoring the email addresses for quite a while. Um, having like the submitter stuff is really crap. We've cleaned it up very slightly a little while ago, not that you'd notice. And the bug, sub but the bug subscriptions should in theory be help for that, but they were implemented at, what, 3 a.m. or something last this morning. So I haven't had a chance to talk to Colin and everyone about what the best way of handling this sort of stuff is. Um, is there another question time for, or are we done? Um, no, we are running out of time, sorry. But at least there was one question. Perhaps you can ask them in the lunch break. Yep. Oh, yep. Yeah. Oh, okay. Go on. Our idea for the subscribing the submitter is, since not every subscriber, uh, submitter wants to be subscribed, might be a mass mailing thing, to have a pseudo header um, that sets whether you want to be subscribed or not, and that's all. And we can make an, we, we could try to make report bug support that, so you can just tell report bug, okay, I want to be subscribed to all bugs I submit, or I just don't want to. And that would solve that problem, I guess, but we have to talk about that. 
Okay, so any other questions, you can bug me later. So thanks for the nice and interesting workshop, AJ. Um, next sessions will be after the lunch, lunch break at 5 to 1. If I remember correctly, um, we didn't get rid of workshop slots. Why didn't I get one for my man page talk? I had to talk 100 miles. Because he sent us a paper and you're not. <laughs> 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 <laughs>